important and very special. Because this is the time we, we have the opportunity to study your word, my Lord, my God. We thank you for this opportunity. For those who have gathered, wherever that they are, to study the word. Those who are on their way, going home, to prepare themselves for the Bible study. But I pray that you will bless each and every one. You will bless each every home. You will bless all your, your children, all their children and their families, their friends, their neighbors. Let's continue to hold on to this Bible study and invite more people to come. My Lord, my God, we leave it up to you because you have the power and the spirit, the energy, the wisdom and everything. We thank you. We do not take this opportunity for granted. And we do not take it lightly. We bless you, Lord. We say thank you. Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Thank you. We commit this Bible study tonight unto you. From the beginning to the end. Success Bible study tonight. My Lord, my God, we thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. <coughs> over to you. Good evening, Mount Zion Fellowship Church. Thank you so much, uh, my elder, for being for this um, powerful prayer. Uh, may God continue to anoint you and uh, use you abundantly for us. Um, I thank God for giving us this opportunity to come together again tonight to begin the second um, letter of Apostle Paul to the... Uh, Trouble world, especially the Jews in in Rome. Um, reading through this uh, second um, episode, as um, I later on introduced last Wednesday, we could see the urgency that uh, prompted Peter to have to write this uh, episode uh, shortly after he wrote the first episode, and one could not just wonder why. Peter was so anxious that Peter was so so uh, troubled, and um, from from my from <clears throat> the comments I, I I brought forward before on the on the on the portal, I was such an, an example of how will you feel if if after you have spent all your life or most of your life to plant churches all over the country, and all, all of a sudden you don't have much time again to spend on this mother art to start visiting all the places that you have uh, uh, planted churches and, and, and then you, you are getting reports that some fake pastors, some corrupt pastors are going there to, to compromise your gospel. They are going there to, to uh, preach heresy, heretic preaching. How will you feel? Because there's no time to travel again to anywhere. And that, that does exactly the question I was asking during the last uh, session that we are all you fee, especially for our missionaries that are going to Africa. So this is an, the, the, the situation which Apostle uh, Peter found himself. <clears throat> and glad and fortunate today, we are starting that chapter one, which which when when I was reading through this uh, chapter one, it was as if to say I, I was among. Uh, 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 um, some 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 students of, of the of uh, theology sitting down listening to to a message of a, a great sage that is a great master sent to us from from a, from a far country and all of us were listening to that message that that this is more or less the, the fear message from this master that we will not see again that we may never see again maybe in heaven so, so this was this, this was this was the picture that this uh, 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 letter portrayed to us. So I'm going to read it patiently again because we we are not going to read the whole uh, 22 uh, verses. And if we are lucky to even treat uh, verses one to four today, we we thank God. So I'm going to read the first 11, 11 verses uh, uh, slowly and carefully for us to to be able to digest when we start. Uh, 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 putting a um, uh, dissecting knife into every word that Apostle Peter wrote here. He said, Greetings from Peter, 
in, in verse 1. He said, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am reading from New Living Translation. He said, I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. And this faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, he said, growing in faith, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the worst corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Verse 8. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fall to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 11 finished. So, what are we saying here? In his first letter, Apostle Peter explained the effect of grace on a person and how one can recognize the changes taking place because of it. Because as I explained to you, when, when, when you are experiencing the grace of God, your life changes completely. Your life is never the same again. Grace enables you to, to attempt to do, to believe that you can do anything. Grace enables you to have confidence in yourself. Grace enables you to believe that you can move mountain. And it's not you. But it is the inner, the inner strength, which is, which, is, which is the grace that is manifesting, which is, which is the grace that is catalyzing it. And when, when you start exercising that grace or manifesting that grace in you, 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 people will envy you because they don't understand. People will hate you because they don't understand. People will, will challenge you because they don't understand. What do you think you are? Are you, are you Goliath? You are too ambitious. You are too, you are aiming too high. But it is because of the grace in you. And, and, and another aspect of grace in you is, is that you become so bold that you are you, you will challenge anything that is ungodly. And when you challenge anything that is ungodly, obviously you, you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law of cause and effect. So they're going to fight back. And it could lead to your death. You don't care whether you die or not because you believe that you are dying for Christ. And that is what faith does for you. Grace does for you. Grace enables you to do, to attempt, to, to stand, to withstand trial. To do anything. So that was what we, we, we all dealt in, with in, 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 in the first letter of uh, uh, Apostle Peter. But in this second Peter, in this second apostle that he, uh, Peter that is writing, Peter deals with a different issue completely. 
because it of its own situation was different. Why was Peter's situation different? Why? You see, imagine for a moment if you were the one that God has chosen to do the following things. Because that was the situation that Peter found himself. And I want you to put yourself in that position now that suppose you are the one that God has chosen to do this, the following things. One of them is to preach the very first gospel sermon. To preach the first gospel sermon. Now, because of time, I was going to start asking questions to deal with that. When did Apostle Peter first preach the, the, the first gospel sermon? <coughs> when did Apostle Peter first preach the first gospel sermon? If anybody knows it, they can tell me, but I'm not going to waste time over that one because we have so many things to discuss tonight. Does anybody know? Apostle Peter was given was, was the, the, to preach the first, the very first gospel sermon. When? Where? How? If you have your pen, just be writing them down. The answer to that one will be found in Acts of Apostles 2, 14 to 25. Because if you remember, if you remember, when they, when they, 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 they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, Everybody started speaking in tongues, speaking in the languages of the people that, that came for the Passover. And people were mocking them that these people are drunk. Apostle Peter now got up that it is nine o'clock in the morning. We could not be get drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. That these people that you see are, 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 are they've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that was when Apostle Paul stood or Apostle Peter stood up and preached the first gospel. If you so 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 that it, so that was what Apostle Apostle Paul that that's what uh, uh, we, we read in Acts of Apostle two fourteen to twenty five. He said, "Ye men of Israel, hear these words: Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know." Him being delivered by the determ determinate counsel. And for knowledge of God, that God knew that, that it is going to happen, it was taken. And by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So Peter preached the first gospel. So, so, so the question I was asking of you is, is that suppose you are in Peter's position at that time, at that point in time, and, and you are faced with this responsibility. The second one is to organize and serve as an elder in the first congregation of the Lord's church. Can somebody tell me again? When was Peter... Among the people that organized the first congregation of of of, of the elders in, in the lost church, and that answer again can be found in Acts of Apostle 15, 6 to ten. And this was when Apostle Peter and Apostle Paul were arguing about how can we now bring the Gentiles into salvation. And that was when they said, okay, the best thing is let us refer this matter to the Jerusalem Council. And that was when they now brought the case of the Gentiles to the, to the to Jerusalem Councils. And that was what we read in Acts of Apostles 15, 6 to 10. So write it down again. And the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After more discussion, Peter got up and addressed them, brothers. You know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe it. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. 
He did not discriminate between us and, and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the next of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? They said the Gentiles must be circumcised, that is, physical circumcision before they can be admitted into the council of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, shall we say, Christ or, or Christendom? They said no. And the origin of the circumcision, this physical circumcision, was a covenant between God and, and Abraham and his seeds. It has nothing to do with me, with you, with all the Gentiles, but we must be circumcised in heart. So that was the second situation that Peter found himself. And then the second, the third one that he found himself is he received the opportunity to be the first in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. He received the opportunity to be the first to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. I'm sure I've already read that one. I've given away the answer. But I'm not going to waste time to ask who, who, when was that happen? And that was the time that it happened when Peter was in Joppa. And he saw a platform from, 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 from heaven with so many different kinds of animals. And the voice said, Peter, take it and eat. Peter said, no, I've never eaten anything that is unclean. And God said, whatever I've made, you must not go unclean. And it was when that platform came down the third time that, that you saw a vision that some people were asking for you, go with them. And who are they? They were the messengers from the house of Cornelius. So, so Peter received the opportunity to be the first in bringing gospel to the Gentiles. So he went, he followed them to the house of Cornelius. And as he was speaking, the Holy Ghost descended in the same way and manner that he descended upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. And then, then the, the, the fourth situation that Apostle Peter found himself in this way is he produced inspired writing. He produced inspired writing. How many how many of, of, <clears throat> of we pastors, apostles today have written anything or inspired, inspired writing? We only write, we, we write novels, we write everything. So, 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 so that it produces inspired writing that we are, we, we are treating today. And then the fifth one is uh, uh, along with the other apostles, he provides leadership for all the churches throughout the then known world. Along with other apostles, Peter provides leadership for all the churches throughout the, the then known world. And we read that one also in Acts of Apostles 14 to 17. Acts of Apostles 14 to 17. Because if you remember again, when Peter, the apostle, in, with, uh, in, in, had that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived there, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So what we are saying now is that the, the, what prompted Peter to write the second letter is, is that in the situation in which he found himself, he realized that he was go, he was soon going to die, and he realized that all the all the efforts that he has he has been making all his life are about to be compromised, are about to be rubbish by some fake pastors, fake uh, prophets. So so imagine yourself in your in, in in position of Peter, one that he preached the first gospel sermon that he organized and served as an elder in the first congregation of the Lord's church, that he received the opportunity to be the first in bringing gospel to the Gentiles, that he produced inspired writing, that along with other apostles, he provided leadership for all the churches throughout the then known world. If he had all these responsibilities, as Peter did, and you knew you were going to die soon, what would you do? What will you do? So the question we are asking ourselves tonight is, is that did Peter know that he was going to die? 
there was no, no, no passage in the Holy Bible, especially in, in, the, in the New Testament, that to say Peter, Peter uh, 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 got a prophecy that he was going to die, or he saw a vision that he was going to die. And there was even an argument, uh, discrepancies or, 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 or misconception whether Peter really went to Rome. Because popularly believed is that Peter was crucified upside down. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome during the reign of, of, a, of a Nero, a Emperor Nero. But there was nowhere that it was mentioned that Peter went to Rome. And according to the early historians of the early church, they said Peter on, on his way, he was running, running away from Rome and, and Jesus Christ, a, a spirit appeared to him that are you going to go away? Are you going to crucify me the second time? So Peter had to go back. And that was when Peter said, this is a vision that, that, that the, the Lord is displeased with me. I must go back to Rome and pay the penalty. And then he insisted that he would not be crucified like the same way or manner as his master, but upside down. But the only clue we have about, about, about Peter <clears throat> being in Rome, or, or not, not in Rome, about Peter eh, 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 start of death was only found in John 21, 18 to 21. When Jesus was with them before he died, <clears throat> he said, truly, truly, I tell you, Peter, when you were young, you dressed yourself and walked where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Verse 19, John 21. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter will glorify God. And after he had said this, he told him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciples whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper to ask, Lord, who is going to betray you? So, was Peter ever in Rome? Even though we read, <coughs> we read in 1 Peter 5.13, there is no obvious biblical evidence that Peter was ever in Rome. But the first episode of Peter does mention that he said, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you, and so that Marcus, my son. So, so, so that elected, that is elected, that, that is with you, in, in other words, they, 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 they were, they, Peter was writing a letter from Rome to these people. And then they said, the Babylon, Babylon in those days was, was a, a kind of a code name. Because nobody must mention Rome. <clears throat> because it was more, 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 it was a very tough time at that time. Emperor Nero declared himself a small god, and if you mention Rome, they kill you, they suspect you. So, 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 so that, but so that among the Christian community, Babylon is Rome. So, what we ask ourselves: Why did Peter return to Rome? If he, if at all he did, why did Peter return to Rome? And so Apostle Peter realized that he is on his way to making the same mistake all over again, now abandoning Jesus and his church in a moment of danger. Peter turns around when he understands that this was a sign and returned to Rome to face the martyrdom. I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for him. But that was the, <clears throat> that was the, the, the historian account which, which the, the New Testament was silenced about. See, so, so what we are now saying is that students let us, they, they told us that Peter was in Rome in AD 67 and caught up in the persecution of Christians going on then. Some say he was finally executed by being crucified upside down. Whatever the manner of his death, he knew the end was near and managed to write one last letter. To the churches before his execution. Peter had one last chance to speak 
to the brethren. One last sermon to give them. One last opportunity to teach them. And um, this letter, Second Peter, contains what the Holy Spirit directed him to write in this final communication. So, 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 see, in, 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 in his first, uh, the verse one, <clears throat> he said, "You go or you die." The first thing he wanted them to remember is the following: as Christians, you must grow spiritually, or you will die spiritually. You must grow spiritually or you will die spiritually. There are a lot of Christians today. They are spiritually dead. Spiritually uh, 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 in slumber. And that's what we, we continue to pray about even with the main ministry. <coughs> against lethargy, against, uh, against spiritual slumberness. So, so, so it's not it's not, it's not a question of I am a Christian then I'm saved. No. No. So that is what Apostle Peter wrote about he, 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 that is emphasizing here that Peter wanted them to remember that Christians must grow spiritually or they die spiritually. You see, Peter reminds them that Christianity is a process, a journey, a transformation that must take place. It's not it's, 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 it's not an instant of something. You cannot be baptized today and, and become a Christian, and become a born again. A born again is a process in which you go throughout your whole life. You continue to develop spiritually. You continue to develop you, your anointing. Continue to increase every day of your life till you die. And along that journey, there will be temptations too to derail you, to bring you back. So you are fighting two battles. You are, you, are, you are fighting an effort. You are making an effort to grow. And at the same time, you have so many distractions, you, you know, pulling you back. So, so that is what we are saying, that Peter reminds them that Christianity is a process. It's a journey. It's a transformation that must take place in chapter 1, 1, 1 to 11. Of his second epistle, he described the changes that need to take place. He described it for us, so so so, so that so that it, this is a very important epistle for all of us. He didn't he didn't he didn't hide anything in in, in, in code in parable or or in, in what that you cannot understand. So so this is this is a, a kind of this is a, 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 a chapter that every one of us must print out and keep and keep and keep and study as a guideline for us to develop spiritually. You see? So 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 that, so that, so that in chapter one, one to eleven of his second episode, he described the changes that need to take place, not only to complete the journey, but also to confirm that Christians are actually on the right road. If you don't fit in into, into what he described in that verses 1 to 11, you are not on the right road. So starting from verse 1, Peter said, Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. He begins by introducing himself and the relationship that he and his readers have. He is an apostle, a special messenger of Jesus Christ. There are many messengers today. We have evangelists. We have missionaries. But only those who have been chosen by Jesus himself and witnessed both his baptism and resurrection could be referred to as apostles, except Paul. But what do we have today? We have collections of apostles. Apostle this, Apostle James, Apostle Peter, Apostle uh, Lambo, Apostle this, Apostle that, but they are not apostles. So what qualifies you to be an apostle? An apostle had a special calling. What is that calling? Jesus himself. Peter went, I mean, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee. He called them, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. 
That is one qualification. Then a special experience that is being with Jesus throughout his ministry. So they must have spent three years with Jesus Christ. And the third qualification, a special task, witness of his resurrection through miracles. Witness of his resurrection. Because if you have been with Jesus for three years, you will obviously be following him and seeing all the miracles he performed. He raised Lazarus. He raised the, 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 the Jairus, the daughter. He raised the, the son of a widow woman. And then there is special authority. Their letters were inspired by God, a special authority that is, they wrote a piece for us, which we are all studying and reading today. So that's what qualifies you to, to be able to call yourself an apostle, except Paul. Now note that he also uses the word born servant. In referring to himself, a term that demonstrates his great humility before the Lord. He called himself a slave, not slave of, of humanity or slave of Rome or slave of anybody, but slave of the Lord. Yes, he is a special apostle with special gifts and authority. But all that means is that he is a slave to Jesus Christ, not someone who lost his position over others. He doesn't love his position over others, as we have so many celebrated pastors today. Pastor that you cannot even touch his clothes. Pastor that you cannot even greet him. Pastor you can do, you dare not stretch your hand to say, I want to shake his hand. And there are some pastors too there that they will not even step, they, they, they prefer to step on the bodies of their congregation. They love their influence over others. They want to be respected. They want to be feared. They want to command. They want to be respected, but respect and respect. So this is what we are saying here. That Peter described his readers as people who are basically the same as himself and the other apostles. People who have been saved because of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are all being saved. We are all equal before God. And it was through grace that all of us have been saved. He may have a special role and responsibility in the church, but in essence, he is connected to them in the same way all Christians are connected to one another. All we are sinners and have been saved through faith in Jesus Christ, made possible by God's kindness and righteousness, which brings us again to the concept of divine grace. So in this next verses 2 to 4, Peter offers a blessing and then explains how we can come into the blessing he offers. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace is the word that encompasses all of the good things that God gives his people. He gives them favor. Peace is the feeling and the condition that one who receives God's grace finds himself in. Peter says that this combination of blessing, which is grace and peace, We bring enjoyment that comes from them. We increase in proportion to the degree that a person comes to know God. It doesn't come automatically. It's not. It's not a, a, a free gift. It depends upon how you come to know God and Jesus, His Son. So this word "no" is not just a casual knowing God that uh, Pastor Lambo preached God to me. No, it's your knowledge, your acquaintance with God. How, how acquainted with are you? It denotes an exact or a full knowledge, the degree of knowledge where the known can influence the one who is known. Hmm. How can we know God? Can we really not know God? What is what, what kind of knowledge are we saying? This is a typical example because one thing is it, it, uh, 
take 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 for example our own uh, 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 natural life biological relationship a lot of children don't know their father even though even though they live they live under the same roof for all their years but but when when the children become mature did you really understand your dad do you really know your dad do you really have full knowledge of your father they will say no no and the same thing goes for us too our are we that our fathers do we, do we really understand do we really have full knowledge of all our children there are some there are some of your children your particular one you understand him you understand her so well you have full knowledge of that child but there are, there are others you don't have full knowledge of them but you still love them because they are your biological children now when it now comes to us knowing god what kind of knowledge of god are we talking about what kind of knowledge are we talking about of jesus christ so so this is the this is this this is what we are we are, we are talking about tonight what kind of knowledge are we talking about of god you see so now <clears throat> before we start asking questions just let me quickly finish this uh, verse 3 then, then we can now because we are, if we can finish four chapters today and four four verses today we are lucky you see then sin so so human can know god only to the degree that he receives he reveals himself human can know god only to the degree that he reveals himself and that was what isaiah did, told us in Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. He said, God said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your way, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, what we are saying is, for example, we can know that God is creative. We, we, we can know that God is powerful. We can know that God is wise from what He has made. Because when you see the heaven, you see the, the sea, you see you see the wave, you see everything made by God. You know that God is powerful. So you know God through His creation. But the Creator doesn't reveal what He thinks. No. What He wants from man. What the future will be or what the spiritual world is like. The knowledge of these things is only available if God actually reveals it to man. So man can only know God and consequently experience the blessing and peace that come from knowing Him to the degree that God allows Himself to be known. Jesus said that the essence of eternal life was knowing God and His Son Jesus Christ as He wrote to us in John 17.3. He said, now this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So concerning this, Peter says that God has opened himself up to full disclosure because he has permitted it through knowledge. He, he revealed himself to us. He didn't reveal himself to the to the to the high priest. To the Pharisees, to the Sanhedrin, because they, they say if if the, 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 the high priest, the, the Pharisees have known that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, they would not have crucified him. Apostle Paul said it. But 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 they, they said they were, and, and that was what in the Old Testament that that they, they have eyes, but they will not see. They have ears, but they will not hear. Because if they hear, they will be saved. So God did not reveal himself to them. He didn't reveal himself to them. So that is what we are saying here. That God will not reveal himself to them at all. You see? So 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 that that, that is what we are saying here. And and Provided in high definition by 
Please announce yourself. Hello? So, hello. So, can you hear me now? Ah, thank you so much. So concerning this, Peter says that God has opened himself up to full disclosure because he has permitted true knowledge. And this true knowledge was made available through the gospel, which he refers to as the calling. So, so that when we are called, it is God, God wants to reveal himself to us. And the appearance of Jesus Christ, who referred to as his own glory and excellence. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. Hear it. So what Peter is saying here is that the life and godliness that come with true knowledge of God is now available because God has fully revealed Himself through Jesus Christ. Because Apostle J. Uh, 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 Thomas asked, he said, "We don't know God." And, and Jesus Christ said, "When well, you have seen me, you have seen the Father." So, 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 and that's what Jesus Christ is saying, that when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So, if grace and peace increases as, as I know God, then there is good news. God is open to be known fully. So, in verse 4, he summarizes and explains the true nature of blessing and peace that he first mentioned in 2. You see, for by this, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by then you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by loss. Through the revelation of himself, God has given us true knowledge. True knowledge gives us access to godliness and spiritual life. And this blessing enables us to escape the condemnation that will fall on those who remain ignorant of God, corrupted by sin and attached to this world. We are not here to save the earth. We are here to call man to come out of this perishing world. In other words, knowing God and Christ is a great blessing because this knowledge permits us to escape the destruction that will come to this world and all those who are part of it. So, in the next Seven verses, verses 11, 5 to 11, which uh, fortunately Pastor Mana will be, will be taking us. He said, <clears throat> Peter explained how this knowledge of God and Christ is developed. It's, it's a cooperative effort involving God, Christ, and the individual. It is a cooperative effort involving God, Christ, and the individual. And here is how it was one. He said, God creates the universe and man. And then sets all into motion. Then two, Christ comes to earth in order to atone for man's sin. Then three, man, man responds to God by believing in Christ and thus receives back the knowledge and relationship to forfeit. Then, then he said, then, then three, he said, God is a knowledge and self control. A wise person becomes a prudent person, a knowledgeable person begins to understand the nature of a turn of, of the enemy and then for self-control and perseverance and then for perseverance and godliness so so these are the seven ladders that Pastor Mana will be teaching us and then godliness and brotherly kindness and then finally brotherly kindness and love so in the next few minutes that we have to ask questions because I, because I don't want us to rush this second Peter at all it's so interesting so that I'm going to stop from this uh, verse 4, so that Pastor Mana can take over verse 5. So now, the first question now is, what does receive a faith as precious as ours? means in this verse. <clears throat> say, because in, in verse 1, if you remember, he said, I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. So, so my question is, what does receive a faith as precious as ours mean in this verse? How does our faith compare to St. Peter's faith? Is our faith equal to his? Why and why not? How do you explain the discrepancy? Does anybody, does anybody, can anybody give us an answer? <coughs> okay. Now, there are, so, there, there, are, there are so so many comments, so many comments uh, uh, as answers to, 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 to this question. But, but I'm going to just read some of them for you 
to be able to, to meditate upon them and then form your own opinion. What exactly Peter received that, that what does received a faith as precious as ours mean? You see, to see the issue of faith as the same as that of Peter, in some ways, it's impossible, mainly due to the fact that in the Western world, the level of perception or persecution is by no means the same. So if we have ever faced real persecution, has it been life-threatening in some ways? We as I should be carried on living and witnessing without a sense of real faith expression. It is without fear that we live, thus our expression of faith has to comfort our zone limitation. We are not facing the same situation, we are not facing the same environment, we are not facing the same persecution. We are saved here. Yeah. So, so, so that our faith is different from him, but, but definitely uh, to receive a faith, but, but the, 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 the main bone of contention is, is that to receive faith, to receive faith is to believe. To believe is to, is to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So because we believe and so did Peter, our faith is equal in our Lord. As we read in Romans 2 and Romans 12, 3. <coughs> because Peter believed in, Peter believed in that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe, everybody believed, Pastor Paul believed, Pastor Mana believed. Lady Madonna believe. So, so if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then it means our faith is equal to, 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 to Apostle Peter. So, so that is number one. Then the, then the, the question number two now is, um, as, as uh, we, 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 we read in verse 3, you see, because that verse 3 says that by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. That is what verse 3 said. So now, meditate on this verse for a few minutes. It is a verse about provision. What is the scope and extent and boundaries of everything we need for life and godliness? What does knowledge or knowing God have to do with this promise. What is the scope and extent and the boundaries of everything we need for life and godliness? What does knowledge or knowing God have to do with this promise? Can somebody tell us? Let me give you an example. Once somebody says, I am pastoring a couple who three months old child faces open heart surgery in the next 48 hours. And this is the third operation. It is life threatening, but they are quietly and assuredly trusting the Lord to heal if it is his will and to use the surgeons to do his will. But if it is not his will that the child lives, they are trusting the Lord, holding to his promises. So, what is the scope and extent and boundaries of everything we need for life and godliness? That what does knowledge of God have to do with this? Everything is exactly that. The only reason we, we even have to ask what everything means is that this is too extraordinary a promise for us to accept easily when things don't go the way we think they should we worry and we doubt and this is where knowing god in the sense of the hebrew yada comes in and trust too if we allow ourselves to form a close enough relationship with god that we trust him without reservation we will more easily hear the promptings of the Spirit and we follow them without question or concern. And we won't run out ahead of Spirit either. We just wait to be led. If we were always tuned in to the leading of the Spirit and never anticipated future developments to the point where we got locked up 
or locked in to a particular outcome with no flexibility to recognize that we might be on the wrong path. We never worry about anything. So the question I'm asking is, when, 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 when Pastor Mana was saying that 2022 will be in a cathedral, and Pastor Pa believed in it, and Pastor Pa started raising money, is it because he has confidence in God? Is it because he knows God? Or what is the, what, what is the degree of, of his knowledge of God? Pastor Pa, can you come in here? Hello? Uh-uh. Yes, sir. So what is the knowledge of God has to do with, with, with the confidence that we have that whatever we ask, we will get it. Because that is what that that is what verse three is saying here. Let me just come in. You were actually on verse three, right? Yeah. So what is that knowledge? What is that knowledge of knowing God have to do with this promise that He will provide for us? For me, for me, I think what the Spirit of God is revealing to me is that when God says He has given us everything, yeah. That's right. And what we have to do to build our faith as Christians, to believe this world. That's right. So we have everything. As long as we have the knowledge of God in this world. So what what is that knowledge of God? Can you can, <clears throat> we can can you enlighten some 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 people to say what what, what how do I have knowledge of God? What does it really mean to have knowledge of God? To have knowledge of God? Mm. Yeah, it's to believe. Mm -hmm. To have faith. That's right. Yeah. You believe in Him. You believe that you have the knowledge of God. You have what it takes to serve God. You have what it takes to endure whatever it takes. That Christ Jesus Mm -hmm. in whatever situation. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much, sir. Then in, in that verse 3 again, he said that uh, <clears throat> we have received all of this by coming to know him, which is that knowledge, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. By means, he, he called us by what? By means of his marvelous glory and excellence so the question now is what does it mean for you personally to be called by his own glory and excellence how does god's glory and awesome presence affect you how does his goodness and moral excellence affect you what does it mean to you personally to be called by his own glory a lot of people give, give give different comments. One say, when I think about the purity and moral perfection of Jesus Christ, I am amazed. He will personally call such a wretch as me. Then when I consider that he is God and is completely satisfied in himself, in his own glory, the effect is overwhelming. I sometimes feel like Isaiah 
when I think of his presence, woe is me. Or like Peter in Luke 5, 8, and then I recall the way his blood has covered my sin, which allows me to be in his presence, and I am all the more amazed and grateful. Don't we all feel that way? Don't we all feel that we are, we are especially blessed for having the opportunity to come together tonight? Because Jesus Christ said that nobody can come to me unless the Father allows him. We are praying every day, every day, every day we pray for our, for, for the, our sins, for our family to join us in Bible study class. A lot of people want to join us, but when it comes to that time, something holds them back. Some people have still been aiming to come for one year now, promising to come, promising to come. And yet there are some of us, three minutes or five minutes to eight o'clock or 7.45, we are already hanging like power worker. It's always the first to, 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 to enter uh, 7.45. So why 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 is his, his own zeal is his own passion different from mine from 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 other people that want to come and they cannot make it? Not because they are busy. They are at home now listening. They are at home now watching TV. They want to attend it, but they just don't want. They just cannot pull themselves. So the goodness and moral excellence of God is such that all sin, no matter how trivial we might think it to be. It's abhorrent to him. I know, at least we always fall short of the glory of God. And this will be a frightening realization were it not for the salvation bought for me by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. So the bar is high, but at least I know that even when I don't clear it, I am still loved by God. So God is, he is constantly ma merciful to us. We only need to reach out to him. And that was what the general Vasya was saying, that the grace is already there. Our, 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 our yearly motto is that God's grace is upon us. God's favor is upon us. The, 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 the scepter is already stretched to us. And all we need is just to, just, just, just to reach out and touch the scepter, the, the, the tip of the scepter, rather than, rather than, rather than, rather than, Claiming what, what is already offered to us, we are running, we are running as casketa to Africa, to everywhere, to look for salvation when the salvation is already here with us. So that is what we are saying. That is what we are saying. So, so, so that, so that, then, 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 then in, in that uh, question number four, they say the, the question number four say, how can a strong desire erode our faith? How can a strong desire erode our faith and corrupt our life? What strong desire can build our faith? What does a strong desire for God have to do with the knowledge of God or knowing God? How are God's promises and evil desire at odds with end with each other? How does one build and the other erode our faith? Because what, what did the apostle <clears throat> Peter right here in, 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 in verse 4. He said, he said, he, he said, by which he said, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through this you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. So what corruption is in the world through loss? So that is what he's saying here. So what? So so, so that what you say, the answer given to that one is, is that strong desire are sometimes very subtle and low. They lull us into not realizing that the corruption of our soul is dominating our life rather than the Holy Spirit. We are serving God. We come to church. We read the Bible and everything. But but we also have second, third, and fourth gods. We have our expensive car. We have our our. Luxury, our wealth, our this, we, we, we worship them more than God. We have our beautiful children, we worship them more than our God. So, so, so these are not, these are not something that you can easily recognize. They are very subtle. 
and they lull you, they, 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 they attract you in not realizing that the corruption of our soul is dominating our life rather than the Holy Spirit. A desire to live according to the holiness that God calls us to will prompt us to be diligent in pursuing the knowledge of God. We will apply ourselves to learning of Him and His holiness. God's promises and evil desire war within our souls. Sin strives to prevent us from experiencing the power of God in our life. Faith empowers us to move forward to more faith and increasingly become partakers of the nature of Jesus. So that is what Apostle Peter is teaching us here. That we must, be, we must, we must, we must strive as much as possible to let the, the, the flesh decrease, let the, the, the spirit increase in us. Then it's at that time that, that we can recognize is, is those things that are pulling us away from God. So do we have any question tonight? Do we have any question? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I don't know how you give this answer. When you say I call it the divine power yeah. that I've given us, mm -hmm. that given unto us all things. All things, that's right. That is things in the light. That's right. So what are all things that the Master has given us according to his divine power? According to divine yeah. power, yes, carry on. <clears throat> he has given us all things that we need. He has given us. He, 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 first of all, he promised to give us the holy, the holy, the, the holy spirit, which is the comforter. He said, he said, he said, it is a spirit, it is a spirit of truth that will not speak of his own. That he will, that it will teach us everything. Because because Christ realized that. In, in those three and a half years that he spent with, with us, he was not able to download all the wisdom, all the, all, all the teachings to us to short a period. So he said, I will send you the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is going to be a teacher to you that is going to teach you everything. But how are we going to benefit the Holy Spirit if you don't allow that Holy Spirit to dwell in us? How are we going to gain from that Holy Spirit, when that Holy Spirit has no place in our heart, because the Holy Spirit does not dwell in 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 in, 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 a, a, in a cage or in in our garb of flesh that is tinted with sin with sin. So He has given us all the tools. He has given us everything that we need to know. Everything now depends on how truly do we know God and Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ said, ask, you will get. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. How do we understand? How do we interpret it? And then he, so he, he went further. He said that uh, he, he, we pray that, 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 that God will give us the grace to be able to approach the throne of grace with confidence that whatever we ask the Father in his name, he will give it to us. We just have to believe. And that is what is operating in Mazayon today. We believe that when we approach the throne of grace with confidence that whatever we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will get it. I don't know if anybody can help me out. Pastor Mana? Yeah, hello, uh, Pastor Lambo. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when we look at that, so that um, question comes, that question is coming from. Yeah. That's right. So, again, what kind of power is it for us? What, what, what do we need? You know, so, um, I mean, it's just like having your cell phone. Mm. There's no power in that cell phone. When the battery dies, the phone dies, right? Mm -mm, that's right. So, God has actually the power. He's talking about, he's not talking about the power. Because he just says that we have a limited power supply available to us. So, we, we, we have access. Thank you. 
Mm. And then he went to talk about sickness. That's what saves life and godliness. You know, again, you know, there, there's nothing in, in, in our life, you know, that he does not cover. He covers everything. He covers right. everything. That's right. He needs with us. We need, you know, for every part of our earthly life, God has given that to us. He's also given us everything that we need to grow in our in our love for Him and in our holiness. He gave that to us. Right. So when you break it down, that's what he's saying. He's given us divine power. That power is not for us to pay back. It's all the power, you know, for good. It's given us all things, the hundred percent of everything, and that pertains to life and godliness, which means, you know, he's given us everything for us to bring in love and for us to bring holiness. That's true. You know, so that's my own understanding of that, Pastor Rambo. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Pastor Pa, are you satisfied? Absolutely. That's right. That's we, what I want to be. That's the power they are giving us. That's right. We thank God. Because we believe that we have God. That's good. So, that's, that's, that's the greatest thing I want us to take from that word. Because they are giving us the divine power. Divine power. And, 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 and when you share that, hmm. Thank you so much. This is this is a very very interesting uh, and a, a, a very interesting question that you have asked. And um, one, um, <coughs> a free thinker Christian was asked. He said, "I suppose that there is an easy answer to this question. Yet at a deeper level within a church set up, sometimes things get blurred and the wood becomes so thick to see the trees." Materialism, we are told, is a dangerous thing. Yet sometimes looking at church building or pastors buying jets is definitely materialism that has got in the way. The devil uses some very subtle skills to lure us into a false way of thinking. And that is when we can be so easily fooled that we feel that our faith is strong, yet we have lost sight of our reality and reliance on God. We have to be constantly vigilant so that we are not deceived by the prince of this world. A strong desire can be missed, can be misplaced if we are trying to please God for the wrong reason and doing it falsely. We cannot deceive God. The desire to know God has a must come from the heart. If we are desiring to serve God, then we need to have knowledge of God and we need to know him in a real way. We will want to serve him according to his pattern and not ours. A lot of prime ministers, head of states today, some of them, they are riding 
a simple cars. They have the money. They are millionaires. But the pastors, but the pastors writing in jet is not working. The only job is doing is the church, and the money for jet is coming from the from the tithes and offering. It takes about one million dollar to maintain an aircraft. It takes about half a million dollar to to have to pay for garage in the in, in, uh, or a car uh, in, in, in the in the airport. It takes another half a million dollar to hire a, 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 an expatriate a, a pilot. From where is the money coming? But by the time you add. You add all the maintenance costs. It's almost about five million dollars to maintain an aircraft from we are from the congregation. Is that what God wants? They say bring all the tithes into my into my warehouse and people will have enough to eat. But who is eating? Who is who is starving? Who is starving and who is eating? Who is eating? These are the questions we should be asking ourselves. And that is where, when, 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 when they mention Malachi, you say, oh my God, they come again. They want to say, God will curse you. God, I say, oh my God. I saw anybody mention Malachi to me, I just close my ears straight away. I said, they come again. They want to use Malachi to blackmail us. I forget that I'm a pastor too. <laughs> so, so that is what we are saying. And that's why Jesus Christ said that, that, that not anyone calling Lord, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But we, 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 we perform miracles when we are alive. We, we did it in your name. We call your name. We wrote in jet. We, we spread the gospel all over the world in jet. He said, away with you, you uh, 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 practice of, of lawlessness. What is spiritual lawlessness? What is spiritual recklessness? These are spiritual lawlessness and spiritual recklessness. That's right. Is true. 
It's not at all. Not at all. Not at all. So where the money come from? Not at all. Where are the stores? Is it from the offering? Or from the car? No. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we thank God because um, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we thank God. So Pastor Mana will be taking us next week from verse from verse five to eleven. Yeah. So so can Pastor Mana close us in prayer? Can we share the grace together? Can we share the grace? Because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
and the love of God and the separation of the Holy Spirit. Rest in me and I will go also now forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we shall join the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much.